uh, thank you so much, everyone, for um, coming along. Um, I, as you guessed, this uh, this talks about um, the uh, the rat industry or the um, uh, remote uh, access Trojan um, industry and the kind of uh, and the markets which have built, been built up to support it. But before we actually talk about something interesting, just to get out of the way, um, some of you know me. Some of you probably. Uh, Hopefully don't. I'm Dan. Uh, I work as a security engineer while studying at uh, Edinburgh Napier. Um, I do uh, software engineering and as of um, up, up until November I was part of the uh, NESEC committee so that was fun. Um, but I do, just full disclosure, I don't do malware as a job. My job is in threat intelligence so um, take that what you will. It is a hobby for me for now. Uh, my, my actual job is in infrastructure so very much detached from all this. But um, as we go, um, as we can try go about dissecting this topic, which is very, very vast, and I can't get into everything as much as I'd like, uh, we'll, we're going to start with a quick introduction on the essentially ancient history, what I find to be the first things which could be considered rats or you know remote admin tools, as the uh, as the developers told them, and we'll talk um, a, a quick introduction on how, on what malware is, on uh, on more specifically what a trojan is. And uh, well, this will all be important <laughs> later, trust me. And then hopefully, we'll, if the talk makes it that long, we'll move into uh, what I consider modern day uh, rad examples. And again, the uh, the markets which have sprung up to support them, which is um, quite important. Um, there will be time for questions at the end, hopefully. So if, again, the topic is quite vast, so if my answers, I don't know. Please don't be mad at me. Um, so first of all, do we all know what malware is? I, I guess we do, but if you're not sure, malware is a is a portmanteau of malicious software, um, a, a software which has been specifically designed to disrupt, damage, or gain unauthorized access. But something I I've, I've noticed um, in researching this is that people seem to take specifically designed like to quite an extreme, and uh, and they think like a EULA, like if if I make a bit of malware, but then stick a software agreement in there that says please don't use this as malware, it protects you. Uh, we'll find out just how true that is. But again, um, malware includes lots of different types of programs like viruses, which are self-replicating, and worms, uh, which uh, can spread by themselves, and Trojans, which we'll be talking about. But essentially, to make it simple, Trojans are basically just programs which rely on deception to be spread. So like whether it's uh, a, a free Fortnite V-Box tool, or whether it's uh, pictures from your RuneScape girlfriend.exe, or whether it's um, whatever someone's sending you, the, the premise is, is that you download it thinking it's something else. So with that in mind, what the hell is the difference between a Trojan and a rat, right? So. There's two, so RAD is an acronym, and depending on who you ask, it either stands for Remote Access Trojan, and this is what, you know, AV companies call them, and, or it stands for Remote Administration Tools, which is what, you know, the producers of these tools call them, because obviously you don't really put yourself in anyone's good books by saying that you produce a Trojan, you know. So, um, whenever I first started researching this, I thought Remote Access Trojan was a bit of a misnomer, because surely all Trojans require some form of remote access, right? Like if, it's physical access, and it's not really a Trojan. You're just at the computer. So um, I like it, it helps to think about it that like a remote access Trojan is a Trojan which specifically goes after as much remote access as possible. So we're talking about an almost administrative level of control remotely over a system. Um, so n now we know all the definitions. Let's start with some very very um, old tools. A long time ago, in a galaxy far far away, Sweden. Uh, it started with Netbus in 1998, which uh, Carl Frederick uh, Nichter, I hope no one's Swedish because I butchered that, um, essentially said in an interview in 2002 that he created it to have fun with his or her friends and it, or for the creator to have fun with uh, his or her friends and it's also for network administrators that would like to remotely administer it. Um, and that's quite like, we'll call back on this, it's, it's, it's important to remember that's why he says he um, created it. And uh, also he claims that it is the first um, tool of its type, which, if that's correct, and I couldn't find any reliable examples earlier, this would make it the first uh, remote administration tool, which is, I mean, it's a good achievement, I guess. Um, but moving on, the feature list, essentially, it, it's a, it uses a client-server architecture, so you'd install uh, a, a copy of the server binary onto a, uh, onto a computer, and when installed, it would uh, it would run automatically and uh, stay in the uh, in the memory, and it would support um, for uh, Windows 98. It would support key, uh, keystroke logging and would allow you to inject your own keystrokes, which every admin does. I don't know about you guys, 
um, and it would allow full display capture and an entire file system access. So that's read, write, any file, any place, uh, modify anything. And, you know, just because he's a great administrator, you can open and close the CD drive at will, which is a very useful thing. And it also uh, has its own tunneling protocol, which enables you to use any, um, any server of this, which you have access to as a proxy to connect to other computers too, which, again, totally isn't malicious or anything. Um, so this is essentially what it looks like. Uh, you can see on the very left, oh, I do, okay, can you guys at the back see? Because this will be useful for the rest of it. Okay, cool. So um, on the left, you can see uh, like open CD-ROM. You essentially just point it as a, a, a single host name or IP and click connect. A couple of things we can gain from this is that there's no uh, option in at least NetBus 1.2 to configure the exact port it connects on. So, you know, quite primitive, very much a fun tool, whether it's meant for admin access, I, I, I really don't know. You can also play a sound and change the volume on the computer. So uh, that, that, that kind of uh, sums it up. And uh, he, he kind of struck gold with this one because uh, only a year later in 1989, he released NetBus Pro, oh. NetBus Pro uh, version 2.0, um, which was essentially just NetBus, but only if you were trying to sell it to a business, and it allowed things like uh, the ability to cache and store multiple servers, and uh, a greater file system access, and like scripts, uh, so you can like run routines on on uh, with, like whatever machines have it installed. But of course, it got quickly hacked, and although it was intended to be more visible and it was intended to leave like a, like like something in the taskbar and stuff, it's very easy to remove those features and then just have a better version of the first. Uh, Remote access Trojan, if that makes sense. Um, oh yeah, and this one had webcam image capture because that's what enterprises are looking for, I guess. Um, but although we're talking a lot about the fun features and how like it's it's such an epic prank and that sort of stuff, um, not the case. Like these are really really kind of offensive tools which can be used for a lot of bad. So in the same year that NetBus 2.0 came out, the original uh, program was used uh, to frame Magnus Ericsson, a law researcher at Lund University in Sweden, for uh, possession of 3,500 child pornographic images. And he wasn't cleared until five years later when a uh, computer expert from the US offered to investigate the case for him. Um, and this is taken from the uh, the newspaper in 2004, The Expressin. Um, the district court uh, states that someone took over control of his computer through so the advanced program NetBus expert expertise. I guess, is required to uh, to use it. And it is conceivable, for example, that someone else used Ericsson's computer as a storage place, although it isn't confirmed whether it was just used as a proxy server or whether someone had like deliberately planted it there and alerted uh, tech the technicians at the university. So I guess we'll never know. Moving on, around the same time, um, this one's a, a, a lot more well-known than NetBus. Back Orifice was uh, released at uh, DEF CON 6 by uh, a member of the um, prolific hacking group Cult of the Dead Cow called Sir Distic. So, I mean, obviously an uh, administration tool, right, released at DEF CON by Cult of the Dead Cow, sure. But essentially a self-contained, self-installing utility which allows the user to control and monitor computers running uh, running Windows operating system over a network. Sorry, excuse me. Um, so, essentially the release here is uh, is very much... Um, tar, like they advertise it sarcastically as a uh, as a remote administration tool, and uh, the their motivations for it. So they released like a full memo detailing like like what the uh, what Black Office could do and why they released it. And essentially, they had made complaints to Microsoft about the security of previous um, operating systems like Windows ME, and um, they released Windows ninety eight, which it was described here as having a Swiss cheese approach to security. So. Things didn't really get better, and things kind of haven't really got that much better. So um, I must have been onto something. Shame about inspiring a generation of extortion, but whatever. Um, so this is what it looks like, a kind of standard Windows 98 program. You can see that this one does have a bit more complexity than, um, than NetBus, whether that was because it was made by someone with, like, who knew more about computers or who, like, who was more serious about making it like a proper bit of malware which could be used. I'm not sure, but essentially like the same list of features uh, with some extra ones added on. Like for instance, you've got a, an HTTP server which you can put onto the put onto the server for the arbitrary upload and download of files. Uh, it has got a you can turn the interface into promiscuous mode and sniff all the packets going through it. I guess 
Um, and uh, most importantly, this is one to remember, as this does show up a lot quite recently, and this was the first program I can find which does it. It has a plugin interface. So if, uh, if uh, let's say, I use a back office at home for administration, and I'd like to upload a custom script which runs in a back office's hidden process, um, I can I can do so, and I can just upload it to to my uh, to my client and just run it on on any computer. So this does instead of waiting for Sardestic to add the feature for me, I can just make it myself. So. That's cool. And it's also, it advertises itself as fully invisible, not appearing in any task list or any file list or any process list at all, um, which I wouldn't imagine to be very terribly hard. Um, and a year later, just like um, Netbus came out with a better version, Back Office 2000 came out the next year at DEF CON, but the story's essentially the same. So um, I would like, it would like, we've only got an hour, so it's not really that interesting. Um, the next year after that, uh, Sub7 was developed by uh, Mobman, who's still on, who's still active in the community, uh, at Greg Tampa on Twitter, if you'd like to find out more about Sub7 or more about, like, the people and their motivations for why they made this stuff. A lot of it's to do with, like, software freedom and, like, <laughs> digital advocacy, which doesn't make sense to me, but, um, uh, th this is notable because it came with a whole bunch of features. This really came overloaded with features compared to other uh, malware at the time, and, uh, it's strived to be the most usable uh, remote access Trojan that that was on the market essentially, um, but one thing I'd like to note here is that it was one of the most it was one of the first widely used rats with um, command and control functionality, which happened through IRC, um, and this is significant because throughout the 2000s, this is what was used by botnets, and I can't find I can find what like an example of a worm which used an IRC to report in, but in terms of like actively like dishing out commands like through an IRC chat room because it's ideal for. Uh, it's ideal for malware authors, right? Because like IRC, I mean, like the servers are already there. It's inconspicuous traffic, and you've immediately got the option to message a whole chat room full of people or just a specific bot. So that's like very easy targeting for like if 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 you want your bot not to do certain things. And this is the first kind of example with it. But um, to properly understand what like what we mean about bots and like botnets and rats and how they all tie in together, we need to understand what a uh, what a zombie means. So. When we talk about botnets, we generally refer to the, the compromised computers which make up the botnet as uh, zombies, which uh, who accept remote commands without authorization from the uh, uh, bot herder, uh, as it will, or whoever's controlling the uh, botnet or um, rat. Uh, but essentially, uh, this term has kind of been forgotten. Uh, install, victim, and slave are, are, are used as well, but of course, like it's, it just means compromised computer, really. Which uh, brings me to my uh, next point, there is, although a group of rat controlled zombies is a botnet, technically, there is, like, t technical differences in, st in, in these two, uh, terms. For instance, um, as botnets scale and, and they're designed to scale and they benefit from scale, for instance, they're used in DDoS attacks and they're used for spam and they're generally used for things where it's valuable to have a lot of different hosts doing the connecting. Um, it's, with the more features, as, uh, as I mentioned, um, Sub7 had 113 features as a version 2.1, which is the one with the uh, IRC stuff. Um, that's not terribly useful for a botnet because if we're connect, if we're trying to infect lots and lots of machines, we don't want to make it, we want to make it as hard to detect and as hard to stop as possible. And if you've crammed it for the features, that's a lot of indicators of compromise. Like, there's a lot of ways for that to trip up, or there's a lot of ways for antiviruses to pick it up or identify processes which connect um, to, which like can view your screen and that sort of thing. So there is a difference in the way that rats and uh, trojans, which are involved in botnets, are used. But that's uh, just semantics, essentially. Um, moving on to the modern day, I decided to start this uh, section with um, like laugh if you want, but essentially the uh, the finding of hack forms is essentially when I would start the modern day of the remote uh, administration tool market, um, because. Like available without any kind of like, uh, like without any kind of special connection, or available just to the clear net for anyone to sign up to, open to new members. It really did help develop a public interest in rats and cement it as one of the most popular ways to kind of induct new black hat members, right? Because to set up a remote access trojan, you don't really need any like skills. The tools are already there. I mean, we'll get to some technicalities with actually running a campaign, which which causes some difficulty, but essentially hack forms did really help to make this a reality because like, if you give all skids the same kind of way to identify themselves, this creates kind of a rapport between different industries. So for instance, if I'm selling like cracked hosting or if I'm like selling illegitimate for whatever reason hosting and you're a malware developer and we both are active on the same forum, there's an implied legitimacy there 
And when you're trading on what is essentially the wild west on the internet, like anyone can scam you, people can promise stuff, you can pay them, and then they'll just leave with the money, right? Because people, like these, these are essentially scam artists we're talking about. Um, like it really does help to have like one kind of identity, and then it obviously um, released like different like paid membership tiers, which indeed help to drive business to the like like so like you can buy like a, like a certain level of membership and then the, the that's kind of like an implicit trust because you've been vetted and you've paid for membership so you you're not just going to take the money and run right um but i think the most important thing about this was how it made zombie monetization like a reality and it made it instead of something being abstract like oh i'll come up with a novel way to make money out of these like you can go on a forum and watch people do it and you can go on a forum and see what people are selling and you know who's selling the malware and you know what they're what they're selling from the uh, like from the zombies right so essentially when we talk about monetization that can be summed up is can be summed up in what the hell would anyone do with my pc if i get a virus why why do they want the virus there except for you know fun or fun with your friends as a uh, as carl frederick put it uh why on earth would anyone want the uh, the malware to be there and Excuse me. In 2009, uh, Brian Krebs asked the same question and uh, wrote a handy article called "The Scrap Value of a Hacked PC," addressing the question of like, "Oh, well, I only use my PC for solitaire. Like, why would you hack me?" And if we want users to start taking security seriously, and if we want them to be aware of the threats that are right there, this is a really important question to answer, like fully. So, forgetting targeted attacks, like me infecting a specific person, here's here's some things which would make like a a. a Computer controlled by a rat, pretty valuable. So straight away, web hosting. So the value here is the uh, anonymity it delivers to the attacker. So for instance, I can sell you web hosting and you can host whatever you want on it. And it doesn't matter if it goes down because there's no way to tie you back to the original hosting, right? Except for me. Um, and then this is, this is used for lots of stuff. So like, um, phishing campaigns will use this, uh, malware hosting. So if you're, um, if, if part of your phishing campaign is to download malware from a site, the site can be hosted here and that way, you know, you're not getting blacklisted from hosting domains or getting arrested because you signed up with it in your real name, which does happen. Um, you can host wares on it. And again, illegal pornography. Uh, people will pay a lot of money to like host this kind of stuff if you can do it reliably. So like, well, why not host it on an Iraq campaign, essentially? Next up is something uh, some of us might be familiar with, uh, virtual goods. Uh, so online games now have like training features and like in order to get people to play nice and in order to incentivize people playing the game, you'll get items which are sometimes worth real life money. And this can range from like, uh, developer sanctioned activities like, um, like the Steam market and Counter Strike and Team Fortress 2 to, um, uh, uh, economies which aren't supposed to be, a re like, like have real life value, but do anyway. Like for instance, you've got, uh, RuneScape and so on and so forth. Um, and a nice, benefit of this is that they're owned predominantly by children like these are people who don't really have that much or young adults at best sorry they like there's they don't really have that much knowledge about computers like generally they don't have that much money so they're the type of person to search into youtube free free habo credits or so on and so forth and you'll see a lot of uh a lot of hosting of uh, or a lot of spreading of the malware on there um and essentially those are then taken from the accounts which have poor authentication and um like, like if, like if you think about it, your Steam account is less protected than your bank account, and I can sell my, I can sell Steam items to anyone, right? So instead of there being like an actual paper trail of me funding money out of your account, like Valve has it, and good luck with support. Um, next up, uh, reputation hijacking. So way back in the day, this was essentially when spammers found a way to mass sign up for Yahoo accounts or Hotmail accounts, and then use the uh, inherent validity of a Hotmail account because. Like, uh, different, uh, like webmail hosts would trust these addresses more given that they, excuse me, uh, given that they had like a, like a security behind signing up and they had spam detection and that sort of thing. So if you find a way to actually sign up to these addresses, it was really good for getting your spam seen by as many people as possible. But nowadays with social media, uh, reputation hijacking essentially means when you take over someone's account, which usually identifies them, like for instance, if you go on any social media or any forum site and you see a post from someone, there's that inherent, there's that inherent value of what they post based on who they are. So if like, if I had Kylie Jenner's account and I posted someone, like people are going to trust that link more than if I posted it on my own Twitter because like there's, like she's got much more to lose than I. So um, 
rats had been spread in order to get access to high value social media accounts, which can be used in further malware uh, spreading or indeed advertising services. Um, although advertising services is much less profitable than, uh, or, or sorry, selling advertising services on stolen accounts is much less profitable than just spreading more malware. So, uh, it's become much more common. Excuse me. And up next, uh, pro probably the biggest and most widespread one would be credential stealing. So essentially, get a rat onto your, onto your computer, take all the passwords on them, and anything which can be used to process money or deliver value to the person running the, the botnet, they'll just take. So this isn't limited. Although they obviously would prefer financial accounts, they'd love access to your, to your savings, they'd love access to your bank account, they'd love all that. It's not just limited to accounts which actually store money. Accounts which are used to process money in general do have an inherent value because of the uh, capacity for money laundering and because the the value of an account used for legitimate reasons is so much more is so much higher than just an account that's just been made, right? Because if I make an account and then immediately use it to sell something worth a thousand pounds off someone else who just made an account, like that, there's like there are fraud prevention and in, in these types of programs. So this does help to evade those. Um, and that's like an example of those would be eBay and Skrill, which both have problems with that kind of um, behavior. And leaving the worst for last, we've got extortion. So I'm sure everyone's familiar with ransomware. Ransomware is much more common than uh, remote access trojans because like there's no management involved. You just kind of you set up a key exchange, send it out, someone downloads it, and all of a sudden they have to pay you, or it's you know they're not getting their stuff back. But we like we love our devices and we trust them with a lot of very sensitive stuff. So it doesn't have to just be like will get access to your system. Like you can use, like, in, like in, to an extent, blackmail. You can find something that they do not want out and use the secrecy of this to then demand money off them. So I don't know if anyone remembers, but early examples of ransomware would say that, oh, um, the FBI has detected um, child pornography on your computer, and unless you give me $500 of iTunes vouchers, you're going to go to jail. Like, uh, that sort of stuff. And, like, uh, that is very much coming from these practices. Like, although ransomware has existed for a while, it's only gotten popular recently, and this practice definitely predates it to a large extent. And um, so if, if you can't hold a system... Um, ransom, the mine on an account. Like again, going back to social media, some social medias are the basis of people's businesses. Some like social media accounts or accounts on external services, like the person needs, otherwise they will not be able to make their living. And so there's, there's value to that. So if they can lock you out of your email and lock you out of your Twitter, then like it's going to be hard to get your account back. And rather than wait 30 days for Twitter support, pay $200, get it back, I guess. Um, and finally, webcam extortion, which is quite a big one because obviously, like anyone can set up one of these campaigns. It's not because you can just download it for free on the internet. There's not really, not everyone's out to make money. The, like there are an awful lot of just very, very sick people, for instance, um, like a webcam extortion. So um, attempting to uh, get lewd photos off someone's webcam without them knowing it's on and then using those images to extort them further is very, very common. And indeed, you can see that mirrored in the, in the forums of today. So if um if you if you can't read that it essentially it's advertising ebooks and services for getting teenage girls and young adult women to install your uh, remote access trojan because these uh, instances of the spreading are are worth more and can be sold to more people and if you're not going to use them yourself someone else certainly will so that that, that obviously fucking sucks but that's a uh, shouldn't swear um <laughs> but that's a uh, um, that, like just part and parcel of this kind of what this kind of access attracts. Like people aren't just here to you know make money out of like bank fraud. People are here to make money in any way they can. And generally, if they're willing to take access to your entire computer without you knowing, they're not really that bothered about extortion either. So let's say we've got into an account, we've made all this money. What like okay, what's the point? Like it doesn't really scale. Like do I just keep making this amount of money forever? Well. As Homer rightly puts it, money can be exchanged for goods and services, and we can actually make our malware better, not only by like uh, like buying a premium version, but we can also employ services by like a uh, tangentially related but different industry or different uh, markets of, uh, of of black hat to make our malware more successful, to make it spread faster. So, um, yeah, I should, that, that, that should have been earlier, but. Um, I, if if you've um, if you've been following, there might be a couple of things that come to your head, like oh, well, if they're just using all these free tools, well, then the antiviruses can block the free tools and I'll be safe, right? Well, yes, but uh, also no. Um, so the idea here is that well, antiviruses can block them, and then it takes longer to make it to to make a remote access trojan than it does to like block one. So eventually, we'll keep up with the tide. Not 
quite. So crypting is essentially the encryption, or it's also referred to as packing, but for, um, for doing it for malicious purposes, it's generally referred to in the market as crypting. It's essentially um, the process of obscuring an executable in order to prevent uh, detection of malicious code. And so cryptos are various functions, but like the core of it is packing. And if you're unfamiliar, packing is uh, shorthand for executable compression, which is um, compressing the file and then decompressing it in memory once it's uh, once it's run. So uh, generally in Windows, the encrypted code exists as a PE resource within um, within the binary, which is then so the the start of the program is essentially the instructions on how to unpack the um, the the program, and then the rest is just and the and the rest is just nonsense until it's uncompressed, right? So while packing has legitimate uses, like back when memory wasn't really that well, it was much more scarce than it was, everything would be packed because you're trying to cram as much onto a floppy disk as you can, right? Like if you've only got like 64k of memory, you don't want something taking up space just because. It's more legitimate, right? Like even Sophos distributed its uh, own antivirus fully packed so it would fit on a floppy disk because things used to run faster on floppy disks, I've been told. Um, but essentially, how it works is um, the, the, the program will start, it'll launch an unpacking routine which will be pointed at a, um, a piece of uh, a malicious code and uh, then it'll just hand over control to that malicious code once it's unpacked and no one will be any of the wiser. So, sorry, excuse me. Of course, it doesn't, it's not just this simple. There are various levels of sophistication, and because we have various levels of sophisticated threat actors, a lot of them are commonly used. So we'll start with the very, very basic ones, which are easy for antiviruses to catch onto, and then we'll go up to like ridiculous, lots and lots of effort, I want to stay undetected for the rest of my life type stuff. So you can use open source packers, but, and on the plus side, they're available for free, right? So you're not paying anyone, more of that profit to yourself. Good job. On the downside, they're available for free, so like everyone else can download them as well. And when you're in an arms race with an antivirus company, you probably shouldn't give your secret key to not being detected to them. So antiviruses have had access to the source code for ages, which makes detecting them pretty trivial. It's just you know finding out how they're uh, packed and then um, like applying that to uh, to the um, files you're scanning. Excuse me. Um, next up the rung, you can pay for a crypting service. So on a public forum, someone will advertise, hi guys, I've made a crypto, and if you want to encrypt your files, you can either pay for access per month, or you can pay for access as you go, so you can pay per crypt, usually a couple of a couple of pennies, like 50p or 20p or whatever. So the source code will be generally attempt to be made unavailable, so you won't have access to it, you'll just have access to the crypted files. So the AV has to reverse engineer samples, and that takes time, a bit more time than it would to find out exactly how to block and, and, or virus or rats which are entirely unpacked. So um, it'll also contain anti-analysis features. Uh, it'll obfuscate the stub. And by stub, I mean that bit of code at the start, which is uncompressed, which is essentially instructions on how to uh, decompress the rest. And uh, it'll uh, behave differently if it notices it's in a sandbox or a VM. So that, that, that's not rat specific. That's very common to, to malware. And, uh, and cryptos, obviously can be, cryptos obviously can be used anywhere, not just with uh, remote access origins. Um, so next up to that, you've got private crypting services. So instead of um, instead of selling uh, like individual licenses or individual crypts, you sell spots on a program. So there's uh, there's limited access, and this is entirely intentional because the idea is if not many people are using it, there's not going to be that many samples. So if I've got a really important thing I want to put a virus on or a piece of malware on, sorry, then I can do that and it won't be detected, right? But the downside is you actually think like, this is actually cost money. Price goes significantly up due to the due to how the business works, there's a limited amount of spots. Um, but the idea here is it'll be updated regularly, so uh, hopefully you evade detection for longer, and it'll have you generally have more advanced uh, anti-analysis features, like it'll obfuscate the control flow when it's being reversed in the API and so on and so forth. And right at the top, the creme to the creme, not universally available and used for uh, legitimate applications as well is a, a virtualized EXE obfuscator, which essentially, instead of decrypting the code, it just runs it in a virtual machine, which has an architecture which is not like any of the architectures we use. So if you're reversing it, you need to learn an entirely new control set or command set and so on and so forth. So like if you're trying to reverse this for answers, it can be quite a pain and can take much, much, much longer. So this is kind of what you're aiming for, but obviously it costs significantly more than the other options. And generally, if you're just if you're just doing it to scam a few RuneScape accounts, you wouldn't, you, like, you wouldn't need to use this. So let's pretend I've done all that. Okay, so I've, I've, I've got my wrap. I've got my, I've got it encrypted. 
how do I even know if it works, right? Because I like I don't want to just burn all my crypts by testing if my rat works, you know. Like I, I don't want to see, I like I don't want to drop it on the alive system and gets detected, and then suddenly I'm not like and I've I've lost that spreading mechanism or something. So if you're thinking a service like Virus Total, you are half right. It would be great if we had services where we could just throw the malware at and it would give us um, the, the the detection rate back. And Virus Total does do that. However, it also provides callbacks to the antivirus companies. So not ideal if I'm a malware author and I'm testing new types of crypting and I'm just sending my sample but crypted in various different ways directly to the antivirus company. That's generally what we want to avoid. So what if we made our own service? But and it did the same thing as Virus Total, but only it didn't send them back. Well, uh, we're 12 years late as um, the counter antivirus services, which essentially are tools which can be best described as mimicking the service that Virus Total provides, but only running the uh, antivirus tools in the sandbox when they uh, load malware into it, which stops it calling back to the original service or used to determine how good um, a crypt is. Um, and essentially. This has happened quite a few times. The most, uh, one of the most recent and most notable cases was refud.me. Started in 2011, um, ended in 2015 because it's still illegal even if you're not the person holding the malware itself. If you enable and make money off hackers, you're at best an accomplice and at worst a bit of a scumbag. Uh, so two charges of the Computer Misuse Act. And interestingly enough, one charge of money laundering because I guess like that's what they care about, right? Like they care if you're making money. So uh, the NCA reported 1.2 million scans using the service in the time it was uh, made available. So, I mean, with a bit of room for error, that's like 1.2 million scans, or were there 1.2 million uh, bits of malware which have been analysed, or different, differently encrypted malware, which is quite a scale. And uh, interestingly enough, it was noticed by Trend Micro because the service also offered um, URL. Um, uh, sorry, domain and IP uh, reputation checking. So, of course, in the same service, because you paid for one, you also get reputation checking thrown in. And, of course, they noticed that there was uh, reputation checks coming from this IP and not um, and not like the actual virus callbacks. So, and so that allowed into the fact that their products were being used uh, maliciously. So, so let's say I've crypted my software. I've, I know it works. I know it's undetected. So how do I know if anyone will fall for it, right? Because, like, the way of spread, like how we spread malware changes as fast as human interest change, right? Like people might want to download free Fortnite V-Buck generator today, but they might not want to download it tomorrow. And I don't want to spend all my time searching on what the kids are doing these days. So of course, I can just go on Hackforms again and find that now that's tiny and I do apologize, but essentially it's various different guides and services for, um, for how to spread your malware promising a range from hundreds plus to 30 to 55 downloads. Per day, so I mean, it, like it, instead of you figuring out, okay, how do I spread this and how do I make it convincing, you just pay someone to do that for you, stick your executable in it, and send it off away you go. So, like up, upload sites go down, content sites get content sites get moderated, and of course, like uh, the metrics for actual monetization change. So, for instance, with uh, Steam trading, it used to be very much that um, if if I scammed a knife off someone on Counter Strike, I'd be able to sell it no problem on multiple sites, but now. Um, to trade Steam enforces two-factor authentication, and it's moves like these which really stop um, uh, remote access Trojan authors and like people who are trying to make money out of this. It's essentially as our security gets better, the uh, like opportunity gets lower and lower for opportunistic scams like this. So that's kind of the, the that's a lesson to take away from this, uh, certainly. And finally, something that people struggle with because you've got like. Um, OPSEC is like essentially a, a universal problem for, for all black hats. It's, um, it's like, no matter what you do, it's not worth very much if you get caught, right? Like you're like, you're not a millionaire in prison. Well, depending on where you live. Um, but whether it's running, um, Skype, Skype support accounts for their malware signed up to their own email address or running a no IP service off their home router, they're not very good at it. So how do we actually, or, how do we, how do they get better at it? Um, the, the, I, I hope they feel forever that I, I don't know how to get better at it. I don't, um, I don't want them to know. Uh, really, as the people who make these malware, like, just to be clear, the people who make these malware and the people who support them through businesses, um, which enable, like, uh, which enable cash exfiltration or businesses which enable, uh, logless hosting or businesses which enable, um, essentially, like, free, like, free EULA software, which totally isn't the malware. Like I mean, they're all they're all cut from the same cloth. They're all just enabling vulnerable people 
uh, on online getting scammed. And like, unless we do something about it, nothing's really going to win. Is this being recorded? It is, right? Uh, well, I mean, if you're if you're a black hat watching, get a job. Seriously. <laughs> Um, so moving swiftly on, uh, Dark Comet was uh, developed in 2008 um, until 2012 by uh, Dark Coder SC, who's uh, still active, still not arrested, uh, I, I, I guess, um, and had 70,000 users at its peak. Um, but essentially, he's quoted as saying the whole development process of Dark Comet was just a challenge for myself, and he had no issues um, for, of developing and providing support for skids. And I'm not really going to go too much into the, te the technical details of Dark Comet because we've already seen it with Sub7, essentially. The programs are, do get very samey. So instead of going through each one individually, I'll, I'll provide one at the end. Um, so for four years, 2008 to... Actually, no, for six years, he, he, he provided support for this with for no problem, the fact that it was being abused. I guess, I mean, in writing, he had a problem, but he also earned 2,000 euros providing support for uh, for uh, for Dark Comet throughout the years, so not enough of a problem to not take money off them, I guess. And then suddenly in, in 2014, uh, this happened. So um, it is with deep regret that I am here to announce the end of Project Dark Comet Rat after over four years in development, hard work day and night to offer you free a tool with the will to make community's expectations of a program of type remote administration tool. Um, I have devoted years with a non-profit philosophy for you to enjoy without asking anything in return other than respect of the rules. Unfortunately, some of you couldn't respect the terms, so because of you, generally speaking, made Dark Comet Rat end. So, sad story involved, just trying to help people with his remote administration tool and then a bunch of bad people use the features built into the program to infect people's computers without them knowing. Happens to the best of us, I guess. Um, so something at right at the end there, and I've highlighted it at the top because I think it's important, without mentioning what happened in Syria, and I guess that must be French for, um, oops, a hostile dictator government used my tool to target journalists within the country and disable their computers and stop them from telling people about what was happening. So, I mean... I don't, I don't know why it closed either. If anyone, if anyone knows, please let me know. Um, and at roughly the same time, uh, created in 2010 was Black Shades, and Black Shades is quite famous. Uh, who, who here's heard of it? If anyone? Okay, cool. Well, I'm, I'm glad it's new info. Um, so available for $40, I, I, I sign on to Forms and pay someone $40, and I get uh, a month of support and uh, this this rat for and, and, and any future updates it gets. So essentially what we're saying, well, with advertising support, they are kind of going after the lowest common denominator here. They are selling it. They're actively selling it to people who don't know how to set up a remote administration tool. So, I mean, short of them being, you know, the red hat of of the rat industry, like this is it's very clear who they want to use this program. And I'll give you a hint, it's not seasoned, you know, network administrators. But essentially, it came in two versions. Uh, Black Shades Net, which was made in VB, um, and lots and lots of features, loads of them, just as many as sub seven, if not more. And uh, hardware ID locked, so once you bought it, it's like you couldn't use that license anywhere else in an attempt to make more money, I assume. And uh, Black Shade Stealth, which was made in Java, much smaller, but featured, and way, way, way less features, but essentially like basic remote access features, and all of the communication was encrypted. So I guess if that was more suited to your needs, then go for that. It was also slightly cheaper, I think. But let's have a look. Black Shades uh, Net, same same architecture, um, same architecture as Netbus. I mean, and this is like twelve years later, so cool, I guess. Um, it was a, you could either use a web or application based uh, command and control framework for yourself. Um, and uh, one thing that's interesting about it, I'd like to note, was a lot of rats at this time, dot com included, offered a customizable payload creation. So. Excuse me. When you're um, when you're making a server to put to to put onto one of your machines, I hope um, it give you a whole bunch of options. Like you could specify the IP connection port, the uh, transport port for files. You could name the server. Um, you could tell you could tell a file name and uh, a mutex. So if you're um, this is important, so if you're sending a uh, a version of your rat to a big list of uh, of machines that you already have access to, you can put a mutex in, and then if a binary if the same mutex is already running. Um, then it, it won't run twice and give you two versions of access to the same machine. So like it's it's clear that this was intended at some stage for like batch usage, like for to control lots and lots of machines, not just like a few um, on your estate. So note the um, the language language used uh, at the bottom there. In fact, that's one. 
USB helps with spreading, as as we know, as we know what spreading is. That's kind of what, like what, what the what we the term we use when we describe like trying to get your malware onto someone else's computer through a method. So that's strike two, and makes your server appear to be a normal file. Strike three, malware. So one tool I uh, I like was the tool I mentioned at the end there, the uh, the clone file tool, which makes your tool look like a, a similar file. So here we have on the left. Uh, People at the back, you have to take my word for it. But on the left, we have um, we have essentially a normal Notepad.exe, and on the right, we have the fake Notepad.exe. And you can replace the icon separately, so it would look exactly like the um, the normal Notepad, but only it would just be 300 kilobytes larger. So, like, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't see that if someone managed to go on my computer, you know. So, just like every other piece of malware, it uses the registry extensively. Uh, to identify the payload, to um, ensure like persistence through reboot, um, to open a f open a new firewall rule so it wouldn't pop up that something's trying to connect, that sort of stuff. Um, very silent, uh, worked very well at the time, or so Akamai says. Um, so once, let's say, I infect someone successfully, it makes the firewall rule, it connects out. This is what I'd see. Essentially, well, what we're looking at is a big potential list box full of um, full of server details and we've got the options to ping, quick search, map view, resolve host name, and then the categories of surveillance, network, system, and miscellaneous. Oh, and server as well. And you can also, there's also chat room. I'm not sure if that allows you to chat with the person on the other side, but that would be pretty creepy too. Um, it enables persistence, or it, it en enables you to access all of the events which happen, all of the um, click and keyboard events which happen using system-wide hooks. Uh, so anything that's typed on any application, you immediately get access to, and I assume I could batch it off and send it to wherever you wanted. Um, looking a bit, oh, I'm one slide too far, yeah. So looking a bit uh, into the features, so system, essentially, like if we, if we think back to Nepos's features, exactly the same features. Um, so like, I think we're correct in saying that Nepos was the first, but uh, full access to the files, full access to the pro uh, processes, registry, Everything basically, and then these uh, these features at the bottom were used to. If you ever would like, let's say, if uh, I infected someone in January, and then by March the crypto I used to close down, and I wasn't sure if it was going to be valid for very longer, I could just crypt a new file and then send them to all of my existing people I'd infected, and then all of a sudden my uh, with limited downtime. I mean, obviously the effectiveness of this stuff varies, but um, with limited downtime, I essentially got a new uh, got a new connection. So. That's cool. And then finally, like every other legitimate um, access tool, we've got Steam Recovery, Fun Manager, Spreading, File Hijacker, Cookie Manager, and Add Clicker. So again, more methods of more methods of monetization there for um, for obviously people looking to make money out of these machines that are infected. So everything kind of pointing to being not a oh yeah, he's back. Um, so not really, not really legitimate at all. Um, and what could happen? Such a great tool, very uh, very feature rich, uh, very feature rich, very um, like it worked very well. People paid for it. It had great support. What could possibly, possibly go wrong next? Oh, um, only the biggest malware takedown of the time so far. With I think there was fifty raids in the U.S., ninety in Europe, or Europol claimed ninety. I'm not sure what their jurisdiction is, but. Essentially, everyone who was anyone involved in the core Black Shades industry got taken down. Um, and why them? That's my question. Why not all of the all the rats before them? Well, I had to think about it. And throughout its life, so starting in 2010, remember, it was again used in Syria and a great source to check out about the use of like um, commercial malware tools in in places like Syria. As Citizen Lab, who do great great work in that area about keeping keeping us up to date with what governments are using and so on and like their tactics and procedures and so on, so forth. Um, and then in, uh, I think it was 20, 2012, um, a Miss Teen USA candidate was, um, was infected with one of these rats and, uh, was actually a victim of sextortion. So essentially they took compromising photos of her using the webcam and then demanded more. Otherwise they'd release the photos. She said no one went to the media about it and he got arrested. So. Good job, her. But I think the main thing that made Black Shades different was that it was run not only in conjunction with other Black Hat businesses, and that should be businesses, not business, but you know, um, it was also a business in its own right. Like between 
2010 and April 2014, according to justice.gov, they made over $350,000 worth of sales. And like, I know it's not much over four years. Like, I mean, especially when you know you go to jail at the end of it, but, um, it's like, it's, it's certainly a significant amount. And if we're talking about like a, a industry, which is essentially kept afloat by children, like that's a significant amount of money stolen, you know? So, and anyway, the list goes on. There's far too many, uh, malware examples to talk about. So, um, NJ Rat is another, um, is, is another notable example made in 2012. Um, in Asia, it loves it. It's, it's all over the place in, uh, in China and India. And it's notable, um, partly because Microsoft, uh, took down 4 million IP addresses related to the service no IP, which essentially, if I want to run malware from my home computer, because I don't think much, uh, what I can do is I can, Get, um, I can use a service like NoIP, which will then attach my router to a domain, and then I can just access my my IP through that domain rather than like having to change the IP I'm using every every 15 minutes. So of course, Microsoft were once um, there was a, there was a big spike in usage, and Microsoft reacted by taking four million accounts or, or four million addresses offline, which is, I mean, all of the um, uh, software advocates immediately got very up in arms about it and said, well, it's it's awful that one company can do that. Uh, I can't use my malware anymore. So that was sad. And then Luminosity Link um, uh, made a lot of money as well. Colton Grubbs, his name was. Uh, so he launched his malware and then offered support uh, by the name, um, under the name of uh, KFC Watermelon on hack forms. So, so you can tell, he literally, I think it was literally 17. Um, and yeah, signed up for his official hack forms Skype account at coltongrubs at gmail.com and got caught. Wow. So that's essentially we're all caught up. So what do we learn from this? Like now we know how the rad industry propagated and how it started and who supports it and why they do it. How do we fight this? How like how, how do we, as in for professionals and students and people who want to be part of the industry, how do we make the world safer, right? So I mean we could go after the profit motive. Um, but to be honest, I don't think that does much because people have things of value. That's kind of inherent. Otherwise, we wouldn't have it. Um, so I don't think disincentivizing. I like. I don't think it's. I don't think this is a technical problem. First and foremost, I feel like in an arms race of big bad companies versus tiny crypto authors, I don't think we're going to win. So I feel like if we could try and disincentivize uses as much as possible, so uh, collaboration with law enforcement from the likes of Trend Micro and companies to bring these people to justice, and for making making it very clear that. If you're going to have any success at all, you will be caught because I think the pain point here is transferring that wealth from prospective wealth online from control of accounts into like real world money and you know food. Like I, if, if we can make that as difficult as possible, I feel like we can really strike at the heart of this. Um, and stopping uh, the hats off, and NCA has started a prevent program recently, which is essentially in line with what I'm with, with the last point there. We need to stop people's first um, like because like kids are broke, like like you know they've got a computer, they've got an internet access. Can I have some money? No, fine, I'll go scam some Fortnite skins. You know, like it's. I mean, it's it's entirely human nature because it's the, the path of least resistance to making money and feeling powerful and all that sort of stuff. So we need to stop kids from having their first exposure in information security. Some very, very talented kids, mind you, some of them, a few of them. And uh, like we need to stop them, stop their first um, like interaction with, stop their first interaction with this, uh, with this industry being, you know, involving the law. So, uh, yeah. So as this, this talk took a lot of effort and there's a few I need to thank for it. Uh, Lloyd is here. Where is he? Wave. Okay, he's over the back. Uh, Lloyd helped me with a lot of the technical details of it because, as I said, I'm, I'm not a malware author. I'm not a malware user. I've done, like, I don't know anything about. Well, I didn't know anything about any of this. Um, and if you're looking for some good feeds to follow, their uh, malware hunter team. No, I've, I've, I got, I got some help from them as well. They know a lot about. Uh, they've been here for a while. They know a lot about historical stuff. And of course, the gold mine that is Brian Krebs on or Krebs on security.com. He covers a lot about the um, the scene and the people who are involved in it. So I'll leave you with a question. How do we encourage uh, m more kids with an interest in this kind of stuff into infosec rather than um, black hat stuff, which you know ruins their career prospect and potentially their, their life and others as well? So tweet at me, and thank you very much for taking the time to listen. Um, are there any questions? But for just for I. Hi, Mikey. 
um, except for the involvement in Syria, no, not particularly. Um, but again, like because of its versatility in the kind of like the kill chain of infection, like it's such a versatile tool, and I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'm certain. That, I, I guess you're talking about ISIS, right? Yeah, so I mean, like, I'm, I'm, I'm sure they do. I, but uh, unfortunately, like, this is so vast that, the, yeah, yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Okay, cool. Well, thank you very much, guys. Appreciate it.